My name is Brian McTeer. I'm a musician and a record producer. In 2009, I started a nonprofit organization called Weathervane Music here in Philadelphia. Our mission is to advance independent music and the community that surrounds it. So I'm talking today mostly to people who make music, but a lot of what I'm going to say would apply to you as well, I guess, if you make film or media or art of all sorts of things. So let me get started here. My first message, your content is worthless. <laughs> That's a harsh statement, but allow me to explain how we've arrived at this conclusion. When we started Weathering Music, the economy was in a tailspin. And recorded music was something at that point that people had largely stopped paying for 10 years earlier. Our goal was to create a new model by which music could more holistically be created and supported. And we started with Shaking Through. It's a documentary series in which we challenge select independent musicians to come to Philadelphia and record one song in two days. Now, for the artists, this is an awesome, collaborative, educational, professional experience. For the, for the public, for the audience, we share that whole experience and that whole process and all the materials that go with it in beautiful high definition audio and video. Our thought was that great music by itself was no longer enough. It had to be accompanied by a great story or a strong message. And we were personally invested in showing that these artists were hardworking and talented. These were all the things that we hoped <laughs> would add value back to the music, and then y'all might start buying it from us again. <laughs> and we were naive. <laughs> but secretly, you know, like everybody at the time, we were also preoccupied with this idea that, man, maybe, maybe our, please God, maybe our content will go viral. <laughs> and at that point, man, we'll be totally set. Because viral success has to equal financial success. We don't know how, but we're, we're sure it must, right? <laughs> well, it didn't. So what's that leave us with? Yes, whether in music, we, had, we were telling great stories. And our mission is noble. But besides that, we were just like everybody else was decades leading up to that point. We were closing our eyes and waiting for lightning to strike, but down deep suppressing the real fear that our content, our music, might never generate a penny. Once upon a time, recorded music was valuable. I mean, for one thing, not everybody could make it. Uh, the, the cost of recording and manufacturing and shipping and distribution, these were some of, just, a, just some of the steep barriers to entry that along with the, the industry's tight hold on its artists and the release of their product I mean, really point to the fact that the music industry, the record industry, had a masterful control over the supply and demand of their products. And it was like this all the way to the late 90s, to the eve of the 21st century, when two things happened. Number one, home recording technology actually started to get really good. And people could make records on their own. The technical barriers to entry, they were fizzling away fast in the late 90s. But number two, this is where I kind of wanted sound effect like thunder to clap. The big number two, oh wow, the big number two. <laughs> <laughs> that just occurred to me. The big number two was Napster. <laughs> uh, overnight, Napster made it so, so any recording ever made could be had by anybody who wanted it for absolutely nothing. In one fell swoop, Napster obliterated the music industry's once tight and, yes, masterful control over supply and demand. And that was it. End of story. 
So here we are. Now this nice, nice music comes in. It's got like harps and more harps. <laughs> here we are today. It, we, we live in a beautiful world where everybody makes music, where everybody knows somebody makes, who makes music. And I really do believe that is a beautiful world. But consequently, what that also means is the world is flooded with the stuff. And if only a small minority of people do pay for it, and I'm not trying to guilt you into anything anymore, if only a small number of people pay for it, well, by definition, it is really only worth pennies on the dollar in comparison to what it was in the past. Well, weather vane to the rescue, right? Because <laughs> we saw this is a threat to the future of music in our culture. If artists can't sell their music, they can't make a living with their music. So Peter and Dan and I, we donned our uh, superhero suits, and we hit it hard. We went right to work. We were going to fix this problem. But sadly, for the future of music, that is all we could throw at it. We had to ask people really nicely to pay for music. And we had to uh, get them to change their behavior because it's the right thing to do. Well, that is nonsense. Now, here's why. Because the problem was never really the people's behavior. The problem was massive oversaturation of recorded music and what that does to an industry that for decades up to this point had recorded music as its lone single product. So we were perhaps you know, looking for solutions to the wrong problems. Or maybe there was no problem at all. But in January of 2011, we stumbled into something awesome. In, in an effort to promote our series Shaking Through to a new audience, we decided to ask the readers of an online home recording forum called Gear Sluts. <laughs> we decided to ask them to download the audio files and remix them from an upcoming episode of Shaking Through. And we asked them to share their remixes back with the forum. Well, man, in like a few hours, hundreds of people downloaded these files. I think there are 750 megabytes. Hundreds of people downloaded it. And conversations broke out on the forum about the band, the song, what microphones we were using, what, what production techniques went into making this song what it was. And you know, even some of the crankier uh, members of Gear Sluts, which is only a couple, um, <laughs> even those guys, they were offering friendly uh, critiques of each other's mixes in the days that followed. But the coolest part, the funniest part, was that people would spend five or six hours remixing the song, and when they uploaded it, they'd issue an apology that they couldn't put more time into it. I mean, when's the last time you spent five hours with a three and a half minute song by a band that you have never heard before. It's a pretty, pretty momentous thing, right? Well, here's why. For these people, this was a learning experience. This was a really great opportunity and a learning experience. And even if you weren't aspiring to a career in music or a career in, in recording technology, even if you were just a super fan of music, this was a concrete, new activity through which you could really deepen your own personal experience with music. But the most important thing, the pivotal element here, was that through the Gear Sluts Forum, this was a group activity, and it connected hundreds of people to others like themselves. Bingo. This was such a successful activity for us that we decided to build our Weathervane membership program around it. Today, there's over 2,000 members of Weathervane Music. And Weathervane members, they know people all around the world. They have friends in Philadelphia, South Africa, Singapore, Las Vegas, goes on and on. And while they're there to you know, to enrich their own skill set and to deepen their own connection with music, these people 
relish the opportunity to help their friends in the community do the same. And that's the model, <laughs> the model. Uh, Weather Bay Music, we're a small nonprofit organization, but I'm gonna say the music industry should take a long, hard look at our model. Don't get caught up in the whole remixing biz and all those kinds of details. What we really did was we found our community and we connected them to each other through our content and special activities designed to forever go along with it. I want to sort of clarify, we don't think of what we do as a subscription model. Because in our minds, a subscription model, that implies that all those folks, they just want like more content, more content, more content. Well, I want to go out on a limb right now and say, we don't need more content. Those folks, they were not chosen for the proverbial endless stream of content like water from a sink. You've probably heard that phrase again and again. No, the world is swimming in content. What the world needs is new activities and experiences that allow us to make real meaningful connections with other people like ourselves. The membership model in music could be really effective here because unlike recordings, unlike new records, which are awesome things and we build our lives and our identities around them, but unlike recorded music, new experiences and activities in music, that is in short supply. I just want to take the last couple minutes and talk to artists, people who make music. How should you think about music? For one thing, if you think you're, you're here to make records and to sell them, well, that is an old model and that is in the past. And the rock and roll myth and the rock and roll fantasies that went with it for decades, those are all things of the past. Remember, today everyone can make music. But a career in music, that is a different thing altogether. A career in music is much more like a career in community outreach. Your, your music, it has to be a beacon and it has to reach like-minded people and connect them not only back to you, no, much more importantly, it has to connect them to one another. I have a good story that I think illustrates this point. My friend Alec Owensworth, he's in a band called Clap Your Hands, Say Yeah, an awesome band. When, <laughs> oh, he'll be happy. He'll be happy you guys clapped. In the past, Clap Your Hands, Say Yeah would go on tour and they would play in venues that held in the high hundreds to the thousands of people, and maybe even more. But this year, in fact, right now, today, tonight, Alec is touring across the country by himself, going house to house, playing in living rooms for no more than 50 people at a time. <laughs> That's crazy, right? Why, why the hell would he do this? Well, because Alec is smart. He is so smart. An artist could easily play 100 shows for 1,000 people each show and never meet more than the staff of the venue they're playing in. Alec, in this living room tour, connects personally with hundreds of people every couple of days. I mean, he can start conversations from back on the couch where he's playing in between songs that are open to and involve everybody in the room. That is real connection. Again, not only artist to audience, but audience to one another. And Alec doesn't think about it like this, uh, but, but I know what's happening here. What is happening, really, whether he knows it or not, is he's gone out into the community that he's a part of, and he has connected people to each other through his art. What that really does is that's laying a more stable foundation for his art going out into the future. This is, after all, all about relationships. <laughs> when I was a kid and I wanted to be a rock star, whenever that stopped, didn't really stop, I guess. When I was a kid, 
we thought our most important relationships would be with folks in the industry, dudes at record labels, promoters. Those are important relationships, yes. But it should be noted that all those relationships are only temporary. That an artist has to know today the only relationships that you can have that are permanent is with your community. And how you carry that relationship could be the difference between a short, really fun career and potentially a long and fruitful one. So I want to thank you because I, uh, this was really a terrifying experience for me. <laughs> and uh, I feel like I'm in the home stretch. <laughs> And I wanted to be funnier, and I wanted to be better looking, but um, <laughs> let me sum up what we're talking about here. Artists, own your connection to the community and protect it as vigorously as you would protect your art. In the past, musicians couldn't have that direct connection with their audience. Today, it is the one thing that cannot be taken away from you. And mark my words. In the years to come, it is going to gain more and more and more value of every sort. To the industry, it's high time for you guys to all start creating some new products. Because your content is worthless, especially that stuff that you think of making and selling by the unit. What the world needs, and what I think we will forever pay for, is real meaningful connection. Art has always had the most awesome way of starting this process. It's the people who figure out how to complete it in this era that are going to be most successful with their content in the future. Thank you very much.